It's the summer of 2016. New York City. And Carl's there to fight the unbeaten Leo Santa Cruz for the world featherweight title. And also on the undercard is a young man having his sixth contest. That man is Josh Taylor. And I'm delighted to say that Josh joins us now. Josh, what was it like on the night inside the Barclays Centre? Because cause, cause we, we sometimes forget that at that point, Leo Santa Cruz was the one who was being tipped to move up to Super Feather, to move up to Lightweight, to get himself in some massive fights. We overlook that sometimes. He was unbeaten. He was the star. What was that like that night? Oh, it, was, it was just brilliant. Obviously, I had boxed a wee bit earlier on the night, you know, so I was on a high winning as well. You know, I, I like to go into the change rooms to see Carl, but not for too long. I like to stay out his way. I'll go in and say good luck and all the best and watch him warming up just a little bit. Um, and I see him get in the zone and I, and I get out of the way, but I remember being very nervous for him. Um, more nervous for Carl than I was for myself, you know, because I wanted them to see him do it. I saw the, the hard work that I'd put in and the preparation that I'd put in, so I was very, very nervous for him and, you know, and... and I was more nervous for him than I was myself, but the, the atmosphere in the place was just electric, you know. Um, I was just totally zoned into the whole fight, so I never had any, I never got any um, pictures or videos of of the night. I was just uh, totally in the zone and, and soaking up the moment. And, uh, you know, I remember watching the fight with such intent, and I scored it, I think, Carl by, by about three rounds. Um, by three rounds, I, I had him winning it, and, you know, my, my score uh, prediction was right, and I remember just the crowd going nuts and, you know, and, and like seeing everybody after it. And, you know, it's just a, a great, great experience. You know, one that I'll, I'll never forget. It's definitely the best um, boxing experience um, I've had um, to date. And uh, it was brilliant. You know, I'll never forget that. He's the champion. He's younger than you. He's unbeaten in 33 fights. Carl, it was... A big risk, and, and, and no disrespects, I can see why most of the Americans, especially, thought that you were there to lose. Yeah, look, and I don't know if it was a big risk because I'd, I'd, I'd unified at, the, at that division. I'd, I'd beaten Hugo Cazares in a final eliminator for Leo's WBC Super Bantamweight title. Um, at, well, Super Bantamweight, and, and he didn't want to fight me. And at all these fights, so the, the Santa Cruz fight, the Quig fight, they all came off the back of me being dropped in El Paso when, when Josh made his debut. Um, so I, don't, I, don't, I didn't see it as a risk. Really didn't see it as a risk. I, I, I was going over there. He had boxed lower than me. He was like originally a, a bantamweight starting at his career. Although he's a taller sure. guy, I felt like I was, a str I was a stronger fighter. And what did it feel like on the night, strength-wise? He didn't feel strong. It just his, his output was... A lot. It was great, and, and I knew I needed to kind of match his output and and not let him overwhelm me. But he wasn't he wasn't physically very very strong. Could you feel it? Could you feel the fight taking a toll on you, or, or taking a toll on your strength and on your stamina? Were you wary of that, knowing full well of his his, his punch output and knowing that this guy can do twelve, he likes twelve, he can go that long. Uh, yeah, look, I was really, really tired in the fight, and, and after the second half, it was just kind of you're on autopilot, and you're just it was all, but it was important to not let him overwhelm me or or out punch me. And I know he, he threw more punches on me, but I, I still punched with him. And it's probably the most punches I ever threw myself in a fight, um, and it was important to it was important to be able to, to try to try my best to to match his output. And Carl, this is this is the the ninth round, the ninth round here. You know, I I I remember having you, in my opinion, a good three, a good three or four rounds up, but wondering sometimes maybe how the judges got it, and also wondering if we were going to see a mad surge from Santa Cruz. We say that as he puts you under a bit of pressure on the ropes. Yeah, um, yeah, I was, I was weird, but he was he was still there was a lot of pressure. He was applying a lot of pressure the whole fight, so I don't know how much he could have applied and. And again, I was just kind of meeting him head on and, and, and trying to work with him and, and you know, seemingly landing, landing the better shots. I think this may have been a round. I can't remember exactly, but he had, a, he had his best round, I think, number eight. And I think it was important for me then. I think I won this round. I can't remember, but 
it was important for me to have a strong round just just okay. straight after yeah you stand up there Carl to come out for the 12th and final round seconds before the bell and and you can see it there you maybe you saw it at the time but everybody is standing perhaps other than just one or two officials at ringside what must that what, what must I mean I'm asking you as a fan what and I've been at enough big fights what must that be like Carl what is that like when it's your last round in a world title fight you're winning just what's what's that like I don't know, Steve. Uh, you know, uh, and I don't want to. I don't want to make something up here, but I, I, don't, I don't really know. It's just like when, win, win around, don't get knocked out. I, th I suppose like I felt like I was in front. I knew it was close, but I felt like I was doing enough to win the fight. So I think I was probably just thinking, don't get, don't get chinned here. So you're focused. You're not milking it. You're not doing a rocky. You're not playing to the cheap seats. You just want to get through this fight. Doesn't matter where it is. It doesn't matter. Just get through this three minutes and don't get chin. Yeah, look, just get it, get it done, get it finished. Wait on the final bell, and um, I suppose at this stage we're a minute and a half in this round to go, and yeah, that's probably the only thing that's on my mind. Just try and stay with him again. Don't let him overwhelm me. That was a good shot landed there, and. Um, you know, just just stay in there, really. And I, and I knew I knew at the end, like I'd done enough. I felt like I'd done enough, I, I, but I was. You're always being away from home. You don't know what the judges are going to see. But I felt like I had I had done enough. Could you sense any desperation in in, in um, as we're going into this? Could you sense any in, any desperation in Santa Cruz's work? Can you sense that he senses that he's losing this fight or lost this fight, and that this is his big chance, the last three minutes? Did you get that sense? No, I don't think he was desperate because I think you know. The pressure that he's applying in the 12th round was the same the whole way through the fight, so it didn't feel it didn't really feel any different to me. Um, and he wasn't like, he wasn't complaining to the referee. He's not one of them types of fighters. He just he just tries to fight, and I knew like I expected that before the fight that that was going to be the case. It's a great round. This I've forgotten how good this round is. To be honest with you, Carl, this is a great last round. A great three minutes. There was a. There was a round, and it's, it's probably this one was, it didn't win it, but it was voted round of the year for that year, um, Ring Magazine and stuff. But it was a, it was a very good round. Look, I'm just, I'm just square on. Like everything goes out the window here. It, like it's real <laughs> novice stuff. The pace of the fight was unbelievable. But, the pace of the fight was unbelievable, wasn't it? I'm just watching it there. That last round was just mental. Yeah, it was a, uh, what a fight to watch. Brilliant. You know it's a special fight when everything goes out the window in the last 20 seconds. And as you say, you're both standing square on and you just trade. There was a moment there when Leo Santa Cruz's father walks past you and he, know, he knows his son's blown it. He knows in the corner and he knows when he walks away. I, I think he did. Yeah, the dad never... I don't know if the dad really ever liked me, to be honest. Um, but the brothers did. The brothers did. Um, but I think, I think they knew that he lost. I, I think Santa Cruz knows he's lost. Yeah. And Tom Schreck seeing it 117 to 111 in favor of the winner by majority decision. And the new WBA featherweight champion of the world, the great Irish champion, Carl the Jackal. The great Irish champion, Carl. That's not a bad label. No, it was good, Dad. And I think see see the scorecards being read out, one seventeen, yeah. one eleven. I thought that was probably a bit wide, but I knew that it couldn't have been for him. Like, there's no way he's won it by that amount. So once I heard that, I kind of knew in my head that that I that I've won it here. And Barry was running about. Barry was saying stuff like, um, I think I remember him saying. Showtime have him four rounds up or something like that, and Shane says, Showtime, like, let's see what the judges say here, you know what I mean? So, um, I think he was a bit worried that Barry was gonna have it in my head that I've won, and maybe I haven't won because of you know, who knows what way the scoring's gonna be, but yeah. Now you're right, once I heard that score, which was quite wide, you get the sense then, you know, there's there's that. 
it's okay now. It's okay because they're not yeah. going to give it to Santa Cruz by six or seven rounds under any circumstances. <laughs> uh, Josh, j just finally, you fought on the undercard. You'd fought on Carl's debut. That was your sixth fight on the undercard there. You'd fight on the rematch the, fo the following year. You were uh, still a relative novice. It was like you're living in fantasy land, Josh. You're living in fantasy land. I know, yeah. It was, uh, I couldn't have had a, a better start to my career. You know, my, my debut was in El Paso and that was on a big world title fight. You know, and then, then in New York and then and then in Vegas again for the rematch. So, yeah, I had, I had an absolutely cracking start to my to my career. And, you know, it's, uh, it's all due to Carl being involved in the big fight. So I was just thankful to be part of it and be there and, and watch and learn and how we, how we done things. So, I I had a I had a sort of great apprenticeship, so to speak, to uh, watching and learning from Carl. It was a uh, you couldn't have bought that experience. So yeah, it was it was brilliant. It was brilliant. Hi, good Steve. Just before Josh, just just before Josh goes, how good is it going to be for me to be able to say that the undisputed late welterweight champion in the world was on my undercard and he made his debut on my undercard and everything else? Like that's a proud <laughs> moment for me. You know what I mean? So um, there's no doubt he's going to go on and, and beat Ramirez and what. Yeah, thanks, Carl. Appreciate it. Thank you. Josh Taylor, thanks so much for your time this evening. Thank you, Josh. No worries. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Thanks, Josh. Now, it wasn't just the Irish-Americans who were attracted to the fight. We saw Rory McIlroy at ringside, but another man was ringside, a man that brings his camera and a man that brings, well, just about everything, really, Colin Murray. So, Colin, what persuaded you to get on a plane and go and watch Carl Frampton win a world title with about six or seven or 8,000 um, New Yorkers from the East Coast on a glorious night in New York City? I just can't imagine what possibly inspired you to do it. It was brilliant, mate. My brother lives out in the States, so it's perfect. So, we, he, he travels all the way back for Northern Ireland games and then... So it was brilliant to, to go over that side and go to New York. From a fan's point of view, we turned up and uh, got our tickets and then we're given these wristbands for a backstage bar and I was, my brother goes, let's go there. And I'm like, no, it's, they're always rubbish. It'll just be that pretentious nonsense. Let's go to our seats, watch the undercard, enjoy the night. Oh, go on, let's go in. I never get to go to these. All right, we'll go in for five minutes. So we opened the door and it was like opening the door to a bar back home in Belfast that Michael O'Neill was sitting re as red faced as you can imagine buckets of beer with <laughs> Harry Barnes um, Christine Blakely shouted profanities at me as soon as I walked in the door and everyone was just absolutely rode off absolutely rode <laughs> off <laughs> no, it, was, it was right a good crack like but I just that the build up that's what I remember mostly was just walking in the you know just Northern Irish voices from the door to the Brooklyn Bowl to the VIP bar to walking through your seats and just saying that guy that you know from the Czech Republic away, that guy you know from growing up, that that, that girl you, you, you knew from, uh, you know, Lavery's or whatever. That's what it was like. I've never really <laughs> been away and seen it so Northern Irish. It was ridiculous. So Irish, I should say, actually. Uh, so, so, Colin, you, you know your sport also. So you knew that how good Santa Cruz was. So even though you're there and you've had a great time backstage in the bar and you reunited with your brother, I understand all that, but you also knew how difficult and how hard a night it was going to be. At what point in the fight, or did you never, could you slightly relax and enjoy the fight? Or was it constantly, you know, because you don't want to ruin your high by a defeat, do you? Let's get it right. I, I think when a fight is in America... You never truly relax unless the the American fighter or the Mexican fighter is knocked out cold. I think like there was one judge who was obviously suffering from cataracts or something, uh, who who scored it even. But um, and the other two got it, I think, about bang on, didn't they? Um, so it, yeah. it, it wasn't so far apart that your arse wasn't going five p fifty p right up until it was announced, you know. <laughs> Cole, when, when, in that last round, the last 30 or 40 seconds, I know you're standing, I know you and your brother are standing up, living every single punch. At, at, the, at the final bell, did, did you fall into his arms? Were you punching the air? You, I know you're saying about the judges, but what was that like? What was that like, that, that end? There's always that. If you weren't so emotionally connected to your homeboy winning, you, you probably would be a lot more relaxed, but nobody really was, apart from Michael O'Neill, who probably needed told the next day he was there.
<laughs> and Colin, once the decision was announced, once everybody's in full voice, you, you, you remembered one thing, no matter how much you had to drink, you got your phone out and you captured yep. that moment. It, it's like you're in a rocking boat. Look at this. I have no idea I took this. <laughs> That's what is up was up from my Twitter account. Yeah, I, think I so, have yeah. no idea. No, I have no that very well. I'm sure it that looks like where it's at. Um, I have no idea. <laughs> Uh, you should always put your phone away when you're drunk. Yes, that's lovely. And you, you've got to remember as well that me the, the Mexican fans that were in there was maybe about 3,000. They started singing, ole, 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 ole. Which, of course, then all the Irish were like, hey! <laughs> 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 yeah, always, always remember that backfiring uh, massively. <laughs> um, but, yeah, that's amazing. I haven't seen that since that night. That must, I must have tweeted that out, blitzed. So... I have to I have to thank Colin here. Let me let me thank him before we go, Steve, because it took me a long time to get back to the hotel. When we got back to the hotel, there was the bar was closed and I was wrecked anyway, so I was a bit of a it was a bit of a boring one for me after the fight. But Colin had bought a few beers back and the only reason I had a bottle of beer after the greatest win of my life was because of Colin Murray. So I have to thank See? him for it. mate. We made up for it the next day, and I had a, we had an unbelievable party the next day. Proper blitzer, and it's funny that I always remember going back to the hotel because I went back not like as in right cars, cars there, cars families there. My mates were staying there, so uh, Ruth and all them. So we went back there, and there was a very big divide, Bunsy, between the ones who'd been at the fight and didn't have to get punched or watch their family members getting punched, and you know, the actual family, which was relief and like just sh shattered. I remember just two things he did to me after the fight. One, he hugged me leaving the ring, which I didn't want, right? We all kind of, I think Nesbitt was right there as well. But anyway, he, he, I remember you hugging down the line and I'm like, well, I can't say no, but I don't really want covered in all the sweat. It wasn't really good. <laughs> but I remember being like disgusted by it. That's like, the truth. Uh, and then when we got back, was like there was the ones that were all up for the party, and then I think it was just a lot of relief and happiness in the family, and like your, I remember you were a beer, slice of pizza, and then your kid, and you went you went straight to bed. So you were, you're right, you were bored, but I always remember sitting there, and your family were there, and then we were all a bit more party like, and then your wife was there, and she hates me, so that was awkward, and then you came back. <laughs> <laughs> and stars. Anyway, so then you came back and just went straight. And I always think that's that's it. I, I love the fact I got to see the first bit of you off camera after the interviews when you left the ring and you just the happiness, the elation um, was like really. I felt like it was a, an invasion of privacy almost if you were that close to it to see what that meant it was unbelievable. As soon as the camera wasn't following you, you know, and then getting back and just seeing the relief and just going to bed like they were two really special moments. I think. Colin, thanks so much for those memories. They're proper memories. And I know exactly what you mean about glimpsing a fighter when the cameras are off. That does feel like a privilege. Colin, thanks so much for your time.